James Patrick Page was born on January 9th, 1944. He grew up in an uninspired suburb near London's Heathrow Airport. Jimmy was an artistic only child with a delicate constitution. He spent a good deal of time alone because no other children lived on his road. For all his physical frailty, Jimmy Page grew up to compose several of rock music's hardest hitting and most enduring anthems. He was very, he's very a feat in many ways, Jimmy. And his voice is also quite an effeat voice. And yet from this persona comes this incredibly rock, this heavy rock music. I mean, deep down big. When Jimmy heard the Elvis Presley song, Baby Let's Play House, he said to himself, that's it, I'm off. At 12, he started teaching himself to play guitar. He began by copying American rock and roll records, then branched out to blues guitarists like Elmore James and B.B. King. What really clinched Page's devotion to rock and roll was how forbidden it was. He claims that his teachers took away his guitar until 4 o'clock to keep him focused on his studies. In 1959, Page joined his first band. After a few debilitating months on the road, he got very ill and decided to pursue a career in fine art instead. But even as an art student, he continued playing guitar. While at art school, a classmate introduced Page to her brother, a young guitarist named Jeff Beck. Few people at the time had electric guitars. Even fewer were as obsessed as these two. Page and Beck inspired and infuriated each other for years to come. A great fan of their playing, Jimmy's mother brought them tea while they jammed in her front room on weekends. Jimmy's mother was a big figure in his life. He didn't get on too well with his father, I remember, but uh, he adored his mother, and um, they were very close. In 1963, 19 year old jimmy was playing during intermission at a popular london blues club someone asked if he'd like to play on a record and a historic career was launched page quickly became the most wanted session guitarist on the lively english recording scene all day long he switched effortlessly between pop folk film scores and country music he recorded with hundreds of artists from donovan to the kinks and from the rolling stones to burt Backrack. Page even played on The Who's debut single, I Can't Explain. He was a true professional um, and talented, of course. So he, you know, he was like clockwork, Jimmy. Though Jimmy excelled at studio work, for a musician of his skill and creativity, it soon got old. Jimmy had been stuck in pokey little studios. He now wanted a bit of live music, getting out there on the road with a band. In 1966, Jimmy joined his friend Jeff Beck at a Yardbirds concert. When one of the Yardbirds quit after the show, Page jumped in. He was so eager to join the band that he agreed to play bass, though he had never picked one up before. He was that desperate <laughs> to get into the band, you know. He, he wanted to play bass. He was happy to play bass. He'd have played drums probably, I think, if <laughs> he got him on the road. Led Zeppelin was Jimmy's chance to put into play all the creative energy he had been storing up. Robert Plant was the ideal counterpart. Robert really was continuously the extrovert, and Jimmy was often the introvert. So as a team, it, it was fascinating and, and, and it was pleasing to the eye and the ear, you know. Supported by the bionic John Bonham on drums, Page was free to go wherever the music took him. They had a real playful touch with each other as players, and they, they were always, uh, I think, kind of in some kind of race to do the unexpected, you know. Fans were transported by Jimmy's total abandonment and by the show he put on as he played. I always find myself channeling Jimmy Page on stage because his sort of the soulful nature of his, of his really intense energy on stage as a player. To this day, the name Jimmy Page is sacred to young guitar players who have only seen his performances on video and DVDs. You go into any music store and kids today are still trying to play Stairway to Heaven to try out the new guitar, you know. Well, that's got to say a lot, hasn't it, you know? This is the riff that I want to be able to play and I'm only 12. 
Page's years in the studios gave him a major advantage as a producer and performer. Dramatic effects like bowing his guitar or playing a theremin on stage earned Page a reputation as a wizard. Offstage activities earned him a reputation as well. Page was reputed to be involved with the study of the occult and a devotee of the English black magic enthusiast, hedonist, and heroin addict, Alistair Crowley. He purchased several homes Crowley had lived in and collected memorabilia connected with him. Jimmy's fascination with Crowley led him to inscribe Crowley's motto, Do what thou wilt, on the masters of Led Zeppelin III. Ultimately, superstitious fans would ascribe many of the tragedies that beset Led Zeppelin in later years to Jimmy's trafficking with the devil. But by 1975, Page's heroin use, as well as the pressures of Zeppelin's notoriety, changes in the rock landscape, and most difficult of all, the band's unparalleled early success, all proved to be formidable challenges to confront. Still, with Jimmy Page's guitar playing as its heart, and Robert Plant's voice as its soul, Zeppelin would indeed rise again. Robert Plant's unmistakable voice graced every one of 10 Led Zeppelin albums for 12 years. No backup singers, only one special guest star on one song. There's no other singer who sounds anything like Robert Plant. Robert Plant has a totally different approach, a different understanding. Plant's otherworldly wail combines all the passion, power, and yearning of the blues players he idolized as a boy with the swagger of Elvis, the earnest emotion of his folk heroes, and the traditional Eastern music he absorbed in extensive travels. He knows every, just about every song by every obscure artist ever made. His lyrics range from mock historic Celtic epics to ethereal folk poetry, tributes to Tolkien, and straight up howls of desire. They are a metal band, but they're so much more because they had this young man, Robert Plant, who was also a poet, had poetry in his soul, dug other people's poetry, and said, my band's going to be multidimensional too. Robert Anthony Plant was born on August 20th, 1948. He grew up in a rural village near Birmingham and close to the border of Wales. At 13, he says, he discovered girls and grew his hair, and his life as a rock idol began to take shape. He was the first one to have the glorious mane of, of you know, medieval blonde hair that every woman wanted. Robert was destined, according to his parents' plans, for a successful career as an accountant. But before his training began, Robert discovered the blues. As teenagers, Kevin Gammon and Robert played together with John Bonham in the Band of Joy. Robert planned to earn a degree from Kidderminster College until he performed the Lemon Song on campus. Uh, we were doing uh, local gigs in this area, one which was the famous um, Kidderminster College gig where the principal pulled the plug out when we... Uh, uh, performed the Lemon Song, which was raw, wild, crazy, and uh, we were thrown out of the college. At 16, Robert left home to pursue his passion. He planned to give himself till 20 to succeed. After a few years with the Band of Joy that included being fired by their manager for not having much of a voice, Robert moved on. When Jimmy Page came to hear him, Robert was singing with a band called Hobbs Tweedle. Barely earning a living, Plant moved in with his girlfriend's large Anglo-Indian family. He married Maureen in 1968, and they had two children, a daughter, Carmen Jane, and a son, Carrick, named for a Celtic general. Despite his cozy home life, Robert cultivated a larger-than-life rock god image. His form-fitting jeans and flirty shirts were about as overt as male sexuality ever dared to go in the 1970s. 
He was one hot guy. I mean, why do you think it all worked so, so well? On stage, he was pure energy and physicality in motion. His presence and his way of moving mesmerized men and women alike. He showed a kind of real fiery comfort with his sexuality that set a lot of male singers free. Like Page's guitar, Plant's voice is a versatile instrument with a range of colors, shadows, delicacy, and unnerving intensity. Because of the sheer power and uh, the uh, influence of all the, the great blues singers, they came up to the microphone, they could split your head in two to have that real sort of conviction and power.